My name is Bo Burchell. Um, I'm the guitarist and songwriter in the band Seosin, and I also produce and mix a lot of records. And uh, hanging out. Give me the Zen tour, please. Got it. I don't. I don't have a Zen tour to give away, but I would, because they're awesome. Um, Ari, right, what's up? Um. I guess we can start. I'll just give you a little tour of kind of what I got going on. Right now, uh, I'll just kind of talk about some gear at first. And uh, then I'll kind of walk you through a session that I'm going to start re-recording. It's, it's an old Seosin song. And uh, kind of open up the files. It's a song from 2002, so it's always kind of fun to... Uh, you know, see where you were at, you know, almost 20 years ago, which is kind of fun. So, all right, let me set this guitar down. Okay. So, what I've got is, let me see if I can make this bigger for a second. So, over here to, let's see, can you guys see this? Yeah. So down here I've got eight channels of Aurora Audio 1073 preamps. These are, these are made by a guy named Jeff Tanner who used to work at Neve. I believe, um, <laughs> um, I believe he had a heavy hand in designing and building the original 33609, if not the 2254, I believe. You could probably look it up and find out. All I know is these things sound awesome, and I love them. So those are eight channels of 1073 flavor uh, preamps. To me, they're a little bit more hi-fi sounding a little bit. They have a little bit more top and bottom, but again, it's like splitting hairs. These, above these, if you can see those, these are real 1073s, vintage ones out of a console that have been racked by Brent Averill. These also sound amazing. And these are kind of my reference of what I compare a lot of the other 1073 stuff to. So that's why when I say they're just a smidge more high and, and lows in the Auroras, I'm comparing them to these. So these are great. Um, these usually live on snare drum for me uh, as I'm tracking. And okay, so moving along. And uh, dude, I don't know how to pronounce your name. A S D C F G H J U K 
IOL semicolon? What's up? I'm glad this might be interesting for you. Let me know if there's any, uh, if also too, if there's any questions you guys want to ask, just ask them. I have my laptop down here and I'm, I'm trying to kind of stay engaged and if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. So just type them in the chat and then uh, I'll get to them as soon as I see them. Okay, moving on up here, I have two channels of the Cappy VP28s. These are kind of like an API um, flavor. I have the inward connections op amps in there that kind of makes them sound a little thicker. These to me definitely sound thicker than like regular APIs. I used to have the uh, the API, what was it, the 3124. <laughs> Tom, what's up? Nice to meet you. Um, so I used to have the the 3124 MB Plus, which had kind of like a built-in summing mixer in it, and I used to record guitars using that because I like doing all of my kind of microphone summing outside of uh, the DAW. So, um, and you guys can still hear me okay, right? My microphone's over here, but I'm kind of talking to the camera. Can you just give me like a, yes, you can hear me? Tom, I think the stream might be a little bit delayed from what is going on here. I did say the uh, the inward connections op amps in there, but in case you missed it, that's what it was. Okay. All right, moving on. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, then moving on to the right here, I have the uh, the audio maintenance lab. Okay, awesome, cool, glad you can hear me. Um, I have the Audio Maintenance Lab uh, 5.4 F50, which is basically their, you know, 2254 clone, which I think it sounds absolutely awesome. Even just running something through it with no compression going on, it just has, you know, I think it's all the transformers in there. Whatever is going on, it just adds this extra bit of little bit of harmonic goodness to it I guess um, then to the right of there I have the uh, Allen Smart C1 LA which is basically there the the Allen Smart C2 but to me it's just well, well in reality it just has more features so I always ran the high pass sidechain cables that you can get from Allen Smart so I was always using the sidechain, and then when I saw this had the built-in selectable sidechain frequencies, I immediately moved over to that and haven't looked back. And I did compare. I have this weird thing where I'm kind of a freak about the, the gear that I'm using. So my wife absolutely hates it, but I always... Oh, hold on, my camera turned off. Hold on, guys. Uh, hold on. There we go. Back online, I think. Sorry about that. Mimidhoff, what's up? I'm just kind of going over some of my gear right now. Sorry, my camera just cut out too. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of talking over some of the gear. You know, you can rewatch the stream later. Just kind of getting into the, uh, some people might think the gear is boring, but to me it's super exciting. I'm just a nerd. So, um, kind of working on this rack right now. So, yeah, so the Allen Smart C2. Um, and then I have all of those inside of a summing mixer that uh, is the Heritage Audio MCM8. So, like I was saying, for tracking guitars, what I'll do is I will track two microphones on the cappies, and then I can blend them using the volume and pan knobs up here, and then these is the master volume. There's, I think there's a transformer inside of here for the summing stage. So 
because I've noticed the tone will change depending on how hard I'm hitting the meters. So I can kind of control how hard I'm hitting the meters and then the mono output of this that is the sum of these two microphones. This then goes to a distressor, which is going to be my third distressor over here, but it's actually packed up right now and waiting to being shipped back to Empirical Labs because obviously they're shut down with COVID-19. So when I spoke to them about returning it, uh, they're, I mean, they're a great company, I would say, especially for customer support. I had a Fatso years ago that the battery went out. There's like an internal memory uh, battery that um, stores all of your settings, you know, because when you turn on your distressor, you'll notice it goes back to the settings that you had it on. So that's an internal memory chip that's in there because it's a digitally controlled analog piece of gear. So my Fatso kept reset, restarting to settings that was uh, something not that I, it was like a default weird setting. So um, I called them, told them about it, and they were able to ship me out a battery like and just be able to talk to Dave Durr on the phone. It was incredible. So anyways, when I called him about fixing this, he was very upfront about, you know, hey, we're, we may not have people at the office, so don't send it yet because you could end up losing the distressor. So that was awesome. But anyways, long story short, it's sitting in the box right now. Circling back to this, usually this would go out to the distressor and then from the distressor into Pro Tools. And then that's how it would look in Pro Tools, just as like a mono track instead of two microphones. I don't like having the... Uh, the two microphones separate in Pro Tools. I like to commit to it beforehand. One of the reasons is because, uh, for instance, on the census fail record that I'm working on right now, we are having a pretty famous mixer. His name's Ken Andrews, and he's going to be mixing the record. So when I receive files to mix, when bands send me you know, three, four, five microphones, the second I start messing with the relationship of those uh, microphones to each other, it can totally change the guitar sound. And you know, if you, I'm assuming that you guys, uh, w you know, record guitars and, and do this for you know work or casually, and you know that changing the different, changing the relative volume between like you know a 57 and a 421 depending on how you're using those to filter each other out, that can really change the, the character of the guitar. So I like to have that committed on the way in because like I said, when bands send me those things or other producers send me those things to mix, if I mess with that just a little bit, it can totally kind of, you know, put me in a corner and, and uh, they might think that I'm trying to change the guitar tone, but I'm actually not, you know, it was more just me trying to mix it. So anyways, Just say hi real quick. I'm doing a stream. Right now? Yeah. Okay. What's up, hi. dude? No. What's up? What's up, guys? Oh, this is my son Atticus. We're at home. I guess he just wanted to say hi. Right? You want to say hi? Just say hi to the camera. Right, that one right there. Say what's up. Hi. Yeah. Awesome. All right, okay. All right, now you gotta go in. Yeah. All right. Bye, dude. Okay. Um, Mibethoff. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Yeah, right? Nice assistant. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to, one of the things I'll do is I, I try to get things pretty, pretty dialed in um, as I'm tracking. I think that it helps a number of ways. If you guys are, you know, uh, think about like guitar players, guitar players especially, drummers too. Um, depending on the gain of, yeah, the phase. Uh, Ari, please remind me if I forget to answer this, I will answer it right away. Um, yeah, so depending on the gain of your amp, that can really determine how hard you have to pick the guitar or the strings, or how hard you can dig into it. Um, if you have too much gain, then you might play softer, and if you have not enough, then you'll be playing too hard. So it's about finding the sweet spot of the amp. And then, so for me, committing to the tone immediately is, is really important to, 
to capturing the performance that's right for the amp and right for the sound that you're that you have in your head so i'm not really like a huge kind of like just track it now and reamp later kind of person um you will see me do that maybe later on today in this particular song that i'm working on um however i know exactly the amp that i'm going to be reamping through and i know that like my setting here is just kind of a process i have for this particular thing with my playing um uh Mimitoff, i have the orion uh 32 hd gen 3 right here and i have it hooked up via usb and hdx and as soon as i move i'm going to kind of be working this way over all the gear and i'll go over every single thing and i'll show you some cool things that i'm able to do with the hdx card and usb that i think might be kind of a hack thing or like a cheat code but um because i don't see other people doing it but i use it and it works out great so um Okay, the phase alignment between the mics before hitting the DAW. Yes, I'm summing into one track. I was just talking about that. So the phase alignment, you kind of just have to listen to. There's two ways I think of doing it. One, it, so one cheat way. In my IOs, because I have 32 ins, I have the ability to... So these, while they are going to the summing mixer, they are also having their own direct out. So I can assign each one of these into Pro Tools just straight from the preamp into Pro Tools and zoom in and look at the waveforms to see if like they're time aligned. Um, but sometimes I don't necessarily care if they're time aligned because I might be using the, the distance from the cabinet to cause some intentional phase shifting to maybe make the the speaker sound a little brighter or a little darker and if you ever if you've ever experienced with two microphones you know that you can kind of shift them back or away from each other and and you can kind of get some comb filtering that happens that um is kind of hard to do in the box afterwards i find it just sounds different even though it's a time delay it's it's like a weird thing that happens because you know the distance from the cab even though it might only be like maybe a quarter inch that it makes the microphone sound different Oh, that's sick, the Goliath HD. They just released a new one. Uh, sorry, I'm talking about interfaces now. Um, I'm responding to uh, Mibidhoff. Hopefully I'm, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but yeah, they just released that new one that's like 64 IOs or something. It's like, it's like the Antelope best IO ever. I forget what it's called, but I saw an ad for it recently, and that one looks super awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, you can always use more IOs, right? Um, okay, so I think that summed up everything in this rack. I'll move on over here. Um, starting at the bottom, I have my Axe FX3. I go, um, yeah, the reamp features are sick. Um, so I have the Axe FX3, which I mainly use for, you know, like writing or quick tracking um, for myself, like personally. Although I did use the Axe Effects on the last Seosin record, and I used it on the second Moose Blood record called Blush, and that was all Axe Effects as well. Um, pretty basic. It's just a you know pretty cool uh, guitar amp modeler system, multi effects thing. So that I normally run out of here, going into. <laughs> Is the mic three is the mic pre the 73 junior no so um sorry I'll, I'll i'll explain this again but i'm just gonna go real fast because i've already talked about the gear here um oh maybe you're talking about this mic pre up here no this is the um again this is the aurora audio um gtq2 and it's the basically the same mic pre as the GTP-8 made by Aurora Audio, same thing here, except this has uh, attenuated outputs, EQ, high-pass filter, um, you know, limited EQ, but it is very, very sil silky. It's really nice. Okay, so back to here. This is my headphone, headphone mixer distribution system. So 
it's a really nice way. So I'm a I'm an all one room scenario here. So I have my console at the front of the room. In the middle of the room, I have like a couch, and then at the back of the room is kind of like a vocal booth and like a drum setup. Um, Josh, yeah, I also did. Uh, I don't think I can do this anymore. I did all three of their full length records. They, uh, I love that band so much. Moose Blood is like, they're they're incredible. Um, so, yeah, so I have kind of a one room setup. So what this does is, it gives me sixteen inputs out of the Orion, which I'm use I'm utilizing this using the ADAT outputs which is great because I don't have to use any of my analog outputs of the 32 available analog outputs that are on the Orion HD. So I go ADAT out into this. These send 16 channels via Ethernet to like these headphone controllers. I'll go grab it real quick, hold on. So these are just made by Behringer and they're powered and uh, all the audio goes through inter ethernet here. So then they get 16 channels of the mix that just comes out of Pro Tools that all do sends for each instrument. And it's pretty, hopefully the reflection isn't too bad, but it's pretty much the same every time. So I've got kick, snare, toms, overheads, and these are cool because they stereo link together. And then, uh, you know, keys click, guitars, vocals, background vocals, and then whatever is left over, kind of like a floater right there. So that's kind of how I run the headphone mixes. So each guy standing around the room will have his own little headphone mixer, and it kind of goes on a stand, and he can do his own mix. And it's great, too, because it, um, as they're dialing in their mix, it gives you a chance to kind of, like, really make sure things that are running smoothly up here because, you know, I mean, it, it takes time to dial in five guys' mixes, and when you let them do it themselves, one, there's nothing for them to complain about because they're the ones dialing in the mix, and two, it lets you focus on things that might be an issue, say, maybe like uh, one of the guitar player's cable isn't working properly or whatever, and you have to troubleshoot these things. Um, so it lets you focus on those without, you know, while the band is kind of occupied doing something else. So, uh, yeah, so that's what this is. Let me put this back real quick. Okay, cool. Sorry, I hope you guys are okay with just like nerd fest over here. This is just, this is just the stuff that I enjoy. So, <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, so above the Axe FX is the headphone distribution system. Again, it's great. And if you're looking to get, um, like a headphone system type thing for your studio, I would definitely recommend the Behringer. Um, to me, Behringer has kind of like a, I don't know, like like a like a cheap uh, reputation, I guess. But for the purpose of uh, headphone uh, output mixing system, I think it was definitely the best solution for me. And uh, I also have the the Behringer eight channel mic preamps down here which I'm using right now for my talkback. And I also use these for um, for just like extra mics on the drums. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I think this eight channels of preamps was something like, I don't know, 200 bucks or $150. And when you're miking up like, you know, like uh, for some of the prog bands, they might have like a little metal, uh, you know, like a metal, um, like trash type sound, you know what I mean? Like a, like a type of thing. And you're like, man, I don't want to spend another $2,000 on a Neve preamp to mic up the trash thing that only happens one time, you know? So that's why I have this kind of eight channels here. And it is nice again, because now I'm using the uh, eight channels of ADAT going out into the Orion too. So that's like another use of the digital inputs there. So it doesn't eat up another analog ins and it's just cheap and easy. And like I said, for those splash symbols and like a China or the stackers or like, you know, all those like extra symbol mics that, you're, that aren't really like high fidelity, uh, they're not requiring high fidelity uh, preamps, I guess I would say, or I would prioritize them lower on my list of importance. Um, okay, um, Tunke. 
Aiden. Hopefully, I'm not butchering that too bad. Is there an Empirical Labs dispresser? Um, yeah, I've got a couple distressors. Um, I have four in total, but only three of them are out right now. Um, you know, I haven't compared it back to back with the uh, the Impressor inside Antelope Audio. Um, I don't have their uh, their uh, what is it? I think it's called the A two FX, like the plugin that lets you run stuff in Pro Tools. I actually don't have that, but um, so I haven't really. Uh, like compared them. Uh, how big is my studio? It's about. Um, it's so it's a it's a three car garage in the, in the in the United States, which um, but it's it's kind of a large three car garage. So it's about twenty by thirty, ish. Um, some parts get a little bit bigger, but for the most part, it's twenty by thirty. The treatment up here. I don't know if you can kind of see, but let me see if I can spin this a little bit and then hopefully I can get it back into, into view. My studio is kind of a mess right now because I'm working on some extra treatment, but let's see here. So, okay, so here is, you can see here this, right? So. So in the front here, let me turn this around so I can see. Sorry guys, I'm so ghetto. All right, so you can see this right here, this little piece. From here to here is about two feet, and this is all base trapping there, all the way back behind my monitors. And then that, from behind my monitor to the corner, sorry, behind my monitor to the corner over there is about four feet out from the uh, corner with the monitors and that's all base trapping and then as we go up here let me see if I can get up to the ceiling so here I have kind of like a first reflection trap right there and then above us I have another like it starts at about a foot of trapping kind of like up there at the ceiling and then it slopes down and you can kind of see that better over here you can kind of see the slope that's there so it starts at about a foot and then it goes down to uh, I think that's almost three feet thick of trapping from the ceiling to here at the front of the room and then it's a good uh, 18 inches from this kind of like fabric wall to the actual wall there so hopefully that kind of and then back over here I've got like my amp wall Let's see if I can zoom a little bit my camera's on face detection right now so it's not really uh, zooming in on stuff but yeah so there's my amp wall over there that's where I would kind of mic up cabs got a bunch of guitars there's the couch my dog Bean is on there, and then that's the back of the room. Right now it's kind of set up as like a vocal booth situation a little bit, but yeah, that's kind of the, the spot. So it's about 20 by 30, all just one big room, and that's how we do it. All right, now let me see if I can get back into back a bit here. Sorry about that, I'm not a cameraman. All right. Okay. All right, okay. Um, let me go. Oh, man, okay. There we go, all right, cool. Okay, back at it. Um, PSI active bass trap. No, oh, are you talking about the one where it kind of phase reverses stuff and you put subwoofers in your room and like at the point of your listening environment, it's timed to where it phase cancels or reinforces certain nulls or peaks in your room? I have read about that, but it seemed like kind of a crazy system. 
Um, okay, Abhishek. Question about summing. Is it better to send your tracks directly to the summing mixer, or is it okay to send the tracks to a bus for processing and then to summing? Um, I think it would be fine either way, you know? I think there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, I mean, you could do, like for instance, say if you only had eight, um, if you only had eight channels of summing, then you would kind of have to send stuff to a bus before you, um, oh, did I get the camera all weird? Uh, it's, I guess it's all right. Sorry. I don't remember what it was looking like before. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you only have eight channels of summing and you're trying to mix a record, you would have to use, um, you would kind of have to use, there we go. Um, yeah, you would have to use buses because, you know, you would maybe do like sum all your drums down to a stereo bus and then send that to like maybe summing channels one and two, send your bass to one and two, guitar or three and four, guitars to five, six, vocals seven and eight maybe. I don't know. Um, I actually don't do external summing anymore. So I'll use the outboard gear when I mix, but I'll use it as inserts on individual channels or on buses inside of Pro Tools, if that makes sense. Cool? All right, all right, moving on. So above, so above the headphone mixer, I have the Audioscape V-Comp, which is, Okay, good. All right, so I have the Audioscape V Comp, which is pretty much the, uh, I think it's like a slightly modified stay level. I had, there was a period in time when I had the retro stay level and I had two of the retro 176s, but I ended up selling them just maybe because everyone else was buying them. I don't know, I felt. I don't know, I, and I just wasn't really using them that much. But then I have this now, which is kind of like my, one of my character pieces on my vocal chain. So I'm tracking usually with um, the flea. I'm trying to see if I have it out right now. I don't, it's packed away. Um, my, oh, hold on. I'm getting a, uh, getting the issue with the stream. Let's see where I'm at. Let me just check something real quick. Sorry guys. Okay. All right. Okay. So yeah. So my kind of preferred, yeah, I know, right? I know, probably. She has, she probably is watching, she's probably like watching a Netflix film and both kids are on the iPads like trying to stream some weird video or something. Yeah, classic, right? Um, okay, so yeah. So I'm normally tracking vocals with um, my Flea 47 into the right channel of my GTQ2. I'll normally add just a little bit of top and then it'll go into the distressor and then out of the distressor into this. And the distressor is mainly taking off just the, the very, <laughs> I know we're both joking, but we both know it's kind of true, right? <laughs> um, the distressor is taking off kind of some of the extreme transients. So I'm kind of doing the whole 1176 into the LA-2A type of thing but with different compressors. So yeah, the, the, the distressor is taking off some of the, the real high extreme stuff. And then the V comp is kind of just adding in that kind of glue and just like the, I don't know. I mean, if, you, if you've heard these, this one particular, he did some mods for it to me where it adds in some extra harmonics. So it, it just sounds cool running through it. So that's kind of like the vocal chain coming in and that's why these three are kind of like here separated. Um, and then moving up to the Orion, uh, we can talk about that real quick. This thing's pretty cool. 
Um, let me go and put my routing on the screen because I want to show you this in case you have any questions about this. So let me get my mug out of here. Okay. Okay. You guys all good? All right, cool. All right, so one of the coolest things that I found about the the Orion 32 HD is that you can use the HD and the USB at the same time. So what I'm doing right now is kind of a, a cool thing. So for instance, like you can kind of, I'll kind of show you what's going on. Let's see. So a dat in, right? We talked about how I'm using the Behringer, uh, just like cheap mic preamp to go a dat into the Orion HD. So you can see that coming in here. Oh wait, I moved it in front. Well, gosh, get out of here. All right. Now you can see it, right? Hold on. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so I'm using the, so here's my talk back mic right here. You can hear it. So this is going into the Behringer preamp, Behringer preamp out ADAT into the Orion, out of the ADAT in of the Orion into Pro Tools, and that is getting compressed with an 1176 here that you can see as I'm talking, right? Yeah. So that gets compressed. And then I have a little trick right here that is kind of like my streaming or like mixed revision or uh, kind of like when I'll do like little tutorials. It's kind of like an automatic gate feature that I've kind of figured out how to do. So what you do is you print a, you know, just sine wave or pink noise, something like this. Sorry. But what you do is you don't route that to your main outs. You route that to, uh, what did I have this at? Bus 21, I think. Yeah. So that goes to bus 21 of a separate compressor. So now that'll be the side chain input of this compressor. You'll enable the side chain here and then you'll, you should be able to see that whenever I hit play, this talk back is going to this compressor. You'll see this compressor just slam way down because I have the threshold down here. So as I'm talking, right, like, ah, so, and then it releases as soon as the music stops playing. And that's why you have to print the uh, the the uh, sine wave because you want it to release as soon as it's done playing. Hopefully that makes sense. Is that is that too dorky or just boring? Let me know. Because I have a lot of these types of really dork stuff. Uh, am I using stock plugins on Antelope? You know, I, I talked about this earlier. I actually don't have the the AFX to DAW or whatever it is, um, but so I don't really use the uh, the internal effects on the the Orion. I'm, you know, I mean my biggest uh, <laughs> next level of mutomatic. Yeah, totally. Um, so like the things that really drew me to it um, were the sound quality and just how flexible it is with the IOs. Like, you know, even this. So as I'm talking about this little talkback thing, most people might not think that this is like really that cool, but to me, this is just freaking awesome. You know, and it lets me do everything all within one box, even though I'm kind of hacking it a little bit. So anyway, so now out of my talkback channel, this is going 
I'll open up my IOs here. Hopefully you can see this. So, so now my talkback output, if you can see this, is going to output, uh, what would this be, 48, I think? Yeah. So output 48 of Pro Tools, right? So that's going to be HDX playback 48. If you look at the Orion routing matrix here. So now my HDX play 48 is being mapped down to mixer channel, uh, sorry, mix one channel three. And then if we go to our mixer here, that is my talk back. So now I have level control of the mixer here, right? So I have this, these first two channels are my audio playback. And then I've got my talk back coming up on three. So I have control over these. I can turn this down if I want. For a little while, now you can again. Minus four seems to be a good spot for the, for the stream. If I can get it there. Oh, now, now I said four and it's not going to go there. There we go. All right. So now out of the mixer, you can assign the routing of mixer channel one and two to USB record one and two. So now the output of this mixer is now being sent to the USB side of the Orion. So now, as I'm streaming in OBS, hopefully this doesn't cause like a huge loop, but I don't know if you've, I can even open these up right now, but audio properties. So now this kind of shows like the audio side of what's streaming out of OBS. This is USB one and two, which another thing that's really cool about the uh, Orion, which uh, I don't think anyone's talked about, maybe because it might be illegal, I don't know, but for, um, so years ago, I, um, I helped record the theme song for Aqua Teen Hunger Force with uh, Schoolie D and uh, Mariachi El Bronx. And it was the craziest thing. So Schoolie D came in and, you know, he's like the main dude that does like the, like the rapping in one of the Aqua Teen Hunger Force songs and like the theme song. And the version that I'm talking about is, uh, the thing that I remember specifically was like, uh, it was like, Something about like, got my money on your mind and, and your mama's on my, and instead of saying like C-O-C-K, he just like wanted to find a sample of like a rooster just going like, Caw -caw! right? So he, like his engineer was like basically a dude that would just go on YouTube and like find sounds on the internet and figure out kind of like how to steal them or download them. And then as I was kind of like at the console working, he would just be Dropbox sending me these like samples of things that he would find on the internet. You know, it's like, it's like, oh man, like this lyric needs like a explosion on it. Like Steve, find me an explosion. And like his whole job was just to like find sounds on the internet, right? So anyways, what I've done, hopefully, like I said, this is a really old session from 2002. So I don't know if my IOs are gonna be inside of here. I actually had to create this one today because it wasn't showing up. But if I, create stereo input and then I go to, yeah, so I go to USB, right? Now, this might, we'll see if this works. So if I go to YouTube and uh, let's see what should we do? How about Ryan? Let's record Ryan. Most people and most businesses can shoot a bit 
So, let's go to the end of my session here. And we'll record this. We can go Ryan talking. And now you should be able to hear Ryan coming through. The rig. Can we not? Why is that not popping up? Oh, because the volume yourself down. How to use it. But not go. anymore. So videos lets you make stunning animations that are custom. So we mute that. So say we wanted to like find a sample of like Ryan talking, right? Of course, he's just standing there. Oh, here we go. Or maybe I just need to speak up. I should probably turn my camera. Check. So, so now I'm going to be oh, re recording the, uh... Ryan talk. So whatever, let's just use this, right? That should be better. Oh, here, he's gonna start yeah. talking again. Eight sick. Oh, that's perfect. Eight sick, let's take that. Recommend for a solid state power amp for making my own IRs. Uh, Behringer makes one. Bye, Ryan. I love Ryan, by the way. He's one of my good good friends. Um, okay, so here's Ryan talking. We have it in Pro Tools now. Eight sick. Eight sick. Right, now we have that. Now we can manipulate it, do whatever we want, and it's awesome. So, <laughs> um, anyways, so if you're ever looking to, uh, you know, cover a song or um, whatever, you need a sample of something, you no longer have to go to YouTube and then do the whole, like, you know, type the URL into that one website where it like lets you download the stuff. Um, so now I can just find things that are online or even whatever it is. Um, you can even record out of iTunes or something, you know, so say like, say I have iTunes open and let's just go, uh, let's just go to the store, right? Or browse. Hopefully my net will handle this. Let's see. All right, Drake, what do you got? So now we go here, just hit record. Go back to iTunes. Let's see what Deep Pocket sounds like. For my nigga Hush. Yeah. So then we'll quit out of there. And now we have, now we have Drake in Pro Tools. I don't know if that's gonna be useful to any of you guys, but to me, it's super helpful. Um, as well as, you know, importing reference tracks or, you know, anything that you might have to just kind of get from the internet, yet it, you know, is sometimes difficult, you know? This makes it way easier, and I've never seen it talked about before. Okay. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, hey, Bo, what is it that made you switch the Barefoots back to the Quested? Um, I don't know. Okay, so a few things. Um, with all with all monitors that have um, like built-in DSP, they have latency to them. So I think the MM45s, which is what I had, had something like three. Oh no! Hold on, wait. Did my camera turn off? Sorry, got to make sure everything's working. All right, I think I'm back. 
Can you guys just give me a yes if everything is looking looking right and you can hear me? Okay, got it. All right. Um, yeah, so so with all monitors that have the DSP built in, awesome, thanks, got it. Um, with all monitors that have the DSP built in, um, there's latency because it has to do a, a you know an A to D and then a D to A conversion. So with the with the with the MM forty fives, I want to say it was somewhere around three point five milliseconds, and I run a stereo set of uh, subs in here. So for me, having my subs aligned with my main, obviously, should be very important. So with the barefoots, I could never get them aligned with the subs without delaying the subs to try to match up. But then because of all the processing that's going on inside of those monitors to try to get them to sound as good as they do, they would just never sound right with any subs. And I tried a bunch of subs. The only ones I didn't try was the really expensive subs that were like made just for the MM45s. And that's because I just didn't want to have like the big thing sitting up there. I don't know, I just didn't like it. Um, and when I had these before, I had them maybe like what, five years ago, I think. And I just loved the way they sounded. And then from there, I started tweaking my studio that I was in before, and then I jumped to the, these are the 208s that I have, or the 2108s. I went to the three, three one one zeros, the three tens, um, which is basically a three-way speaker with a 10-inch woofer. And I really liked those a lot, but then for whatever reason, I just like, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you guys know what it's like. You get gear, and you just kind of get this like wild hair up your ass and you're like, I want to get something different. I want something better or more expensive. Or I'm, I'm upset with like, you know, maybe how my stuff's sounding. And you kind of like, you might try to like blame it on your equipment, you know, or, or whatever it is. Or you feel like there's something else out there that's going to help you. So I think that's probably why I switched to the barefoots. And then after a couple years on them, I just kind of started like, hearing certain characteristics about it that it didn't really like suit me very well, I guess. And then I found another set of these and I just like sprung for it. And now as soon as I got these again, I'm just like, oh, okay, now I'm, now I'm back home. It's just like a, a comfortable feeling, I guess. Everybody listens to music differently and, or they hear music differently. And uh, I don't know, the way I hear music with these in my room is just awesome. So. Yeah, I, I like these a lot. It just feels very natural. Yeah, I know, right? Dark side of gas. Um, okay, so I think I've explained this section of the rack now, which I think I'm okay to move on to the next one. You guys cool with that? I'll take that as a yes. I'm going to move this a little closer so I can see. All right, um, so here... I have, starting at the bottom, I've got the Burl B26 uh, monitor controller. And I, I had the Cranesong Avocet, which is also fantastic. But I recently switched to this because since I'm kind of like in a one room scenario, this gives me the option to have a separate mix for control room and studio. So I can actually have two sets of monitors going at the same time, if that makes sense. Yes, every monitor has you know two sets of monitors or three sets, whatever. But this gives me the option of doing uh, two different sets for my control room, as I call it here. So I have my Quested's and then I have over here just like a little like Bluetooth speaker that has a wired eighth inch headphone jack input that comes out of the burl. So I kind of test and listen for certain things on that. Um, yeah, totally. Buying and selling is just like, <sighs> at least for our wives, right? Like we, it's like, it's so funny. Cause like we buy all this stuff and it's like, 
are, you know, if you guys are married or girlfriends or whatever, like, how did you just spend that much money on a volume pot, you know? Or like, you didn't even think that's so much money. But to us, it's just like, well, that's just what it costs. It's, it's what we do. So anyways, um, so control room is these sets of speakers over here. Um, and my goal is to have over on my amp wall over here, I want to have, um, let's see if I can just spin my camera again. We're already here. So over here, my goal is to have another set of like speaker stands here, and that way, the the guitarist will be able to control their own mix, but instead of being on headphones, they'll be able to blast another set of monitors coming out right there. That that way, I can preserve my hearing because I like to listen like somewhat quiet so um, that way I can have me sitting right here in the sweet spot you know and then them just blasting themselves out over there because some some people just don't like wearing headphones as well there's like a different I feel like there's a different experience when you listen to music on headphones compared to speakers so um, yeah but that way when I'm tracking, I have my own volume knob for, for him over there to like blast him out. And then when I want to come back and listen to mine over here, I can listen to that way. So that's one of the main reasons why I sold it. But it is also nice too because this gives me one, two, three, four, five, six analog ins that I can play even all at the same time, which is kind of weird. But it is fun because then just for... Recre recreation or just casual fun, I can, you know, enable Pro Tools and then also enable like the iTunes output so I can have, you know, Axe FX or a guitar coming into Pro Tools and then have them coming both out of the same speakers at once, which is kind of cool. So that's kind of a nice feature of that. Um, and then here, what I've done is this is like the old stereo, I and mean, you can probably barely see it, but this is the old stereo linking uh, metal faceplate thing that happens for, uh, uh, not happens, uh, this is the, it's like a stereo link switch that I had to buy when I had the two retro 176s, and it was just a stereo link switch. Literally, that's all it was. But all it is is just a, a latching switch. So what I did is instead of having to use the sub out or like the second set of speakers on my monitor controller, I have them coming out. And then this is my subs on or off button because they have the ability to do a quarter inch foot switch in the back. So I just wired those foot switch to this little switch and then this turns my subs on and off. They pretty much learn all the, I mean, they pretty much stay on the majority of the time, unless I wanna try to like kill that bottom octave and just focus on like something that's up above. But yeah, for the most part, they stay on. Um, let me see if I'm making, I'm making sure I'm not missing any questions here. Nice guitar collection, thanks. Maybe I'll go over that later at some point. Um, do you use IEM headphones when it comes to drum tracking? Yeah. Yeah, so I have, I don't know where they are right now. They're probably inside. Um, but yeah, I use a company called JH Audio, and they're just the ones that I use for, for Seosin when we uh, tour. So um, I use those, I just put them in here, and they, I, I mean, it's like, if you've ever used uh, real good IEMs before, when you put them in, it's like, and you can't hear anything. I mean, I can still feel the drums because they're only like, you know, 15 feet away, but um, it definitely makes it to where I can have the drums so I can just barely, because like I said, I don't really like listening to things too loud because I just get burnt out. So I'm usually pretty quiet, but m I find most band people like to just blast music. So I'm usually listening quiet and they, and then everyone else is here on headphones and 
um, that lets me hear everything precisely. And then again, when I'm tracking, I have like my own mix that I'm dialing in and then everyone else in the room has their own mix. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay, I guess sticking with like kind of the monitor section here and let me know if you guys have more questions too. I'll, I'll answer pretty much everything. Um, so now going over here, I've got the, I have these two Midas EQs in a uh, radial workhorse and these are straight up just adding a little bit of top end to um, to my monitors. So out of here it goes into these EQs and then to the monitors. And the reason why is because these, um, for the person that's probably was asking about the Quested's, you know the, the Quested's are a very like warm speaker I'll say and very flat. Um, but because I'm listening to them, I mean, these are almost like six feet away from me. So I like things kind of like far and, and wide. And if you've, if you've really gone down like the monitoring rabbit hole and like mixed a bunch of records, you can, you can, you know, there's something called fan, you know, phantom center image or whatever it is. But I find that the placement of how wide my monitors are or how close together they are will influence how loud my vocal is or how loud I'm mixing guitars or the bass or the kick or the center image basically. It kind of controls how prominent your center image is. So to me, getting the speakers at the right width to give me the desired center uh, distance, I guess. it's almost like when you close your eyes and you, and you hear the music, does it does it feel like the the music is surrounding you kind of like everything is like equal distance away or does it sound kind of like a flat line which doesn't feel natural to me i guess it's it's a hard thing to understand but uh hopefully that kind of makes sense but anyways what i'm saying is since my monitors are a little farther away i like to just give it like man it's maybe like just a couple db at like 8k and above just to get some of that air back into it that's all those are doing. Above this is my IGS tube core. It's like a mastering uh, uh, Veramoo compressor. It's really cool. It does something really nice with the mid range, just makes it like creamy and harmonically rich for a lack of better term. Uh, I'll throw that on the tube bus sometimes and it just kind of like really is that extra little, extra little 2%, right? That's like, that's kind of what we're always looking for. Um, any questions on that stuff so far? Mimidhoff. So mine, so mine is an equilateral triangle if I sit like right here. I don't know if you can, yeah, like right here. But I prefer to be a little more inside of it. So it's just a little bit more, uh, I forget what that's called. Isosceles, maybe? So it's more like that. Um, same distance away from each speaker, but just more inside of it. So it's like a wider triangle instead of like that. So, yeah, what would that be? Obtuse. Obtuse, right? An obtuse angle. Um, anyways, yeah. Everything good there? You can move on? All right. Okay, down over here, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Okay, all right. Okay, so over here I have a St. Rock React IR. It's like a reactive load box, um, impulse response loader box. This lets me if I want to, I can record guitars quietly. It goes into here and so out of my amps, into this, out of here, into this Focusrite ISA 430, which is like a preamp and EQ. So I'll, I'll again, EQing and kind of working on stuff before it even gets into Pro Tools. And then out of here, into Pro Tools. So this is a really cool solution, especially when we're trying to kind of like blast through a bunch of rhythms and we don't really need to oh 
Um, let's see. I'm assuming you're talking about the the Manly Veramu. I think that they're different. I would say this is more. The two core is probably more in like a. Uh, I would say it has a similar character to like a Fairchild, more that kind of vibe compared to the Manly. The Manly I feel like is a little more. Uh, Uh, I don't know, like, again, these are, like, so, th like, all the differences are so small, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like it's just, like, w the frequency at which you would hear the, the effects happening is just, like, shifted just a little bit. So it's, like, similar effect, just different frequency that is being affected, if that makes sense, hopefully. I know that's like not really a great answer, but I would compare this more to a, uh, a Fairchild rather than the Manly. Also, Antelope user here, both the Centaur and the Rotor, uh, the big studio here has Orion 32 plus. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay. Two distressors here. Like I said, usually I have a third one here, which will go out of here into the ISA 430, into the one distressor, and then into Pro Tools. Um, I have these two distressors here that are usually on uh, kick, but as well as I have everything, I have my patch bay normaled to where everything can be going into the preamp, into Pro Tools, or into the Orion directly. Um, or through a certain chain, whatever it is. Um, but then I also have these available inside of Pro Tools. And I don't know if everything's labeled right now. Like I said, this is an old session. But yeah, you can kind of see how most of this stuff is labeled. But I can tell already that these are wrong. This is like from last year's I.O. setup. Usually everything is labeled exactly in Pro Tools, so if I want to say like, I want to put a compressor on the kick drum and I want it to be distressor number one, boom, and it just pops up as distressor one and it's already wired in. So above that, I have, um, okay, cool. So above that, above those two distressors, I have the, uh, the uh, ADR Compex, which is kind of like the, the classic, you know, Led Zeppelin drum room smash compressor. It's just awesome. It's it's got like a really cool breakup when you hit it really hard, and the compression is really fast and like explosive for drums. I love that kind of sound. I like fast compression on drums. Um, and above above that, I have two. Um, these are old uh, Telefunk and EQs. They're old uh, W395s out of a old console from. Germany, I believe, but they're they're kind of like little mini Poltex, you know. It's kind of like a fixed, a fixed 60 hertz low shelf and a fixed 15k shelf. Even though, you know, and just like Poltex, it's like even though it says 15k, it's affecting way down to like 2k, you know, like because of the slopes are so gentle. Same thing with the 60. Um, if you boost the top and the bottom, it's almost like you're just cutting like 300 to. 700 type of thing and then the mid-range is cool the only downside to those is they don't they only come in 3 db steps so sometimes it's either like too much or not enough and you kind of just have to pick your battle with it so that kind of sums up all the gear uh you know do you guys have any other questions i don't think i had time to go over like the songs and stuff or like any sort of the work but um if you guys have more questions i'll answer them and I can hopefully answer as many questions as we can get through.
Well, if you guys want to keep in touch with me or follow the stuff I do, you can find me on Instagram or on YouTube. If you find me on YouTube, I think I think my channel is either Bo Burchell or Hugh Fring, something like that. Oh no, wait, I'm in here. I'll just comment right here. What's up? This is me. Oh, cool. Questions. Awesome. Any secondary monitor choices? No, I have this little USB. Um, it's called a Big Jam Box. And it's just like a little, you know, iPhone speaker thing. I love that. Um, another thing I'll do is I have another uh, app in here. I forget what it's called, but I can stream to my phone uh, directly, which another thing, another, actually for doing mixed revisions, I love using this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's an app called Listen To by Audrio, I think, and it's pretty great. You can just pop it on your master. I think everybody should be using this right now. Oh, Audio Movers. That's who makes it. So you go to log in, and then you go start transmission. Hopefully it'll work with this uh, copy link. New paste. Now I can go here, open this on my phone. Start streaming. Okay. So hopefully this is not going to mess up the stream here, but we'll see. So now I can go back and play this. Let's see, is this going to mess up? Yeah, it will. You guys won't be able to hear it. Oh, I think there's a little bit of latency, so you could. Hold on. Something's happening right now. Oh, that's why. Bluetooth. So you can see how it uh, it's just streaming right to my phone. You can kind of do like a phone check right there. It's kind of nice. Um, little, little thing. But yeah, those are basically my, my three things. I just... I'm one of those people that I just know these so well now that, um, oh, I better stop this so it doesn't mess up our stream. So, yeah, I'm one of those people that, that likes to just have one set of monitors, and then I'll go to the, the, uh, the jam box, check it there, and then between those three and my phone, it's pretty, pretty dialed in. Is that a LA3A on my right? No, this, you're probably talking about this. This is the uh, Audioscape uh, V-Comp, which I guess is, it, it has some of the hair of, of uh, LA3, like, the, like that kind of harmonics, but I think it's based on a uh, uh, stay level. Harmonic saturation gears. Um, pretty much everything is harmonic saturation to me, you know. Um, Abishek. Yeah, right? I mean, you just stream it right there and you don't have to bounce it and print it and uh, it, it's it's great. That's a, It's a really cool plug-in service. But yeah, as far as the harmonic gear, I mean, pretty much everything is harmonic coming in. I'm not I'm not being too conservative with, you know, not worrying about uh, I mean, clipping, definitely worried about, but I, I, you know, I, I think at this point you just you just learn your gear and you know the sweet spot of where it wants to sit, how hard you can push it, uh, 
chaining things together to maybe attenuate. So like some of your stepped attenuation gears, you know, sometimes 5 dB is too much, then it's distorting too much. But you can chain something else into it to attenuate it down so that way you can still hit that sweet spot, if that makes sense to you. Um, all right, cool. Well, I appreciate you guys hanging out. Um, I'm probably going to start doing this on my personal YouTube page as well. So give me a follow there. And uh, I'm always posting videos and stuff of what I'm working on on Instagram when I'm, when I'm able to. Sometimes with the, the bigger projects, I can't really post as much. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out. Appreciate you guys. And uh, stay safe. And we'll talk to you. Bye.